and thank you for joining us for another episode of Owl Out Nevada, your go-to podcast for insightful glimpses into the Nevada judiciary. I'm Seth Beasley, your host, representing the Administrative Office of the Courts. I'm Charles Ron, your guest host this week, also representing the Administrative Office of the Courts. Today, we are discussing the important work of the Court Improvement Program, also known as CIP. To discuss this topic, I am delighted to welcome to the studio Zaide Martinez, Court Improvement Program Officer for the Administrative Office of the Courts. Thank you very much for joining us, Zaide. Thank you. Thank you for having me. To kind of kick off this conversation, can you start by giving us a bit of an overview of what the Court Improvement Program does and its mission? Yes. So... I'm going to do my best today to give an overview of the court improvement program. We do touch a variety of areas and a lot of different programs and initiatives that we have. So essentially, the court improvement program enables the courts and agencies involved in child welfare system to develop systemic statewide changes to significantly improve the handling of child welfare cases while ensuring compliance with state and federal laws. And this is strictly regarding child dependency and child welfare matters. CIP oversees the application for and distribution of federal grants. And we also set minimum standards for program and funding criteria. We also establish evidence-based policies and procedures to plan and develop these statewide changes designed to improve the quality of the court process for children and families. We also prioritize timely permanency. It is really important for our children and families in the system to get some stability in the quickest time as possible. Right. So that's a lot. Yeah, it looks like you have a lot uh, going on in CIP. So can you touch a little bit on how CIP came into existence and what was kind of the driving force behind its creation? Yes. So CIP has existed in Nevada since 1995. It's been around for a while and it comes down from the feds. The Court Improvement Project was created as part of the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act of 1993. So this act designated a portion of their funds to state court systems to conduct assessments of their dependency courts and also to develop and implement a plan for a system improvement. Then the adoption of Save Families Act of 1997, um, which most of the dependency community knows as ASFA, which regulates all of our timeframes, reauthorized the CIP funds in 2001. The state court improvement programs were enacted because courts were under extreme pressure to implement a multitude of federal and state laws, which imposed new duties on the courts, and it greatly increased the complexity of, of cases and the processes for cases. Furthermore, I know this is it, the historic, and this is kind of why it's such a very, I want to say, a unique and intense area. So each state across the nation has a court improvement program, and it's expected that the Supreme Court and their administrative office of the courts facilitate collaboration among key stakeholders to identify and address barriers to achieve safety, permanency for a child and families within the judicial, legal, and child welfare system. So how does CIP interact with its stakeholders to improve the handling of child welfare cases in Nevada? Okay, so CIP interacts heavily. That's basically the scope of um, what we do or uh, what I do. We heavily interact with all stakeholders. They fuel our improvement efforts and also they drive what we need to do to improve the system. They identify barriers. So CIP has a variety of methods and feedback loops that foster constant interaction with multidisciplinary stakeholders. Children and families in the child welfare system touch a variety of systems across the judiciary, and that's why it's essential for us to not work in silos and work together and constantly communicate. Um, So we have the CIP Select Committee. We have various uh, multidisciplinary stakeholders from judges, tribal representatives, agency administrators, court appointed special advocates that help uh, drive initiatives and approve and review a lot of the court improvement program efforts that we're doing, all the way to our community improvement councils um, that are in each jurisdiction. And that is made up of multidisciplinary stakeholders within their community. And of course, myself, uh, the program officer works really close with our child welfare agencies from the Family Programs Office to our local uh, child welfare agencies from across the state. 
So you mentioned a lot of the state organizations that you work with, everything from judges to CASA to the local councils. Can you tell us a little bit about what role the federal government plays in supporting and guiding CIP at the state level? Yes. So the federal government basically plays a heavy role. They are the ones that set our guardrails for the requirements we need to meet. CIP is basically living off grants, right? That's So we have to meet a lot of requirements that the feds put in place for us. So for example, right now is enhancing our efforts for quality legal representation, quality hearings, and child welfare collaboration. So that is an example of um, the specific guardrails that the federal government does. And so the Children's Bureau is the federal entity that the Court Improvement Program works under. And we must follow um, strict program instructions For example, one of those is collaborating with a child welfare agency where we should have one significant project, which we collaborate together. But our culture is to continue collaborating, even if it's not just one project. And we also have to do an extensive self-assessment at the end of the year, which they evaluate our um, projects and our data and also a five year fluid strategic plan. So what kind of data, what kind of statistics are they looking at during that evaluation? So a big one is timely permanency. Um, When we are having our first permanency hearing, um, we have strict ASFA timeframes, which is at least having a permanency hearing within 12 months. ASFA has federal requirements. If a child is out of a home for 15 out of the 22 months, um, we should move forward with um, looking at permanency options and scheduling a permanency hearing. Nevada has stricter timeframes. It's 14 out of the 20 months. Okay. So let's go a little bit into the grant side of things. So can you explain the process by which CIP applies and receives federal grant funds? Yes. So CIP is funded by the Children's Bureau, and we get those funds by doing our self-assessment, which I've mentioned, and we have to adhere to the three projects that they have. And they can't be just small projects. They have to be very extensive projects. And they are also really looking into our collaboration with the Child Welfare Agency as you know, as they should and as we should collaborate. The self-assessment could be up to 50 pages long with a five-year strategic plan. And that's how they are able, the Children's Bureau has a team for Region 9 and they will review the self-assessment and provide feedback. If they need clarity, um, they would follow up with me or my administrator, assistant administrator, John McCormick, and just ask away in the (laughs) Feds really like to ask away um, (laughs) to every dot and rightfully so because they are, you know, funding um, the program and our initiatives. Right. Okay. so can you give any examples of the projects that these funds support? Yes. So during COVID, they really played a role in getting vatio bridges for some of our jurisdictions because everything kind of stopped, right? And that was before remote hearings and all that was a thing in the judicial world. So it was really crucial that we kind of acted fast. And thankfully, we had those funds accessible to us because, you know, these are children's and families' lives that matter and we couldn't just stop. And the CIP funds we're able to get the Vadio bridges um, to continue remote hearings. We do have a data collection system for our CASA partners. Um, it's called Optima and allows them to get unified data for their program. So we help uh, fund that. We also, CIP is evidence-based, data, data, data field. That's how we show our progress improvement um, to the feds and also to ourselves. So we have to contract a researcher to make sure um, because Initially, CIP internally here, it's a very small group of individuals right. <laughs> that work within the CIP program. So we contract a lot out and we do have our researcher data savvy and they do deep analysis of our of our programs, our efforts, our timeliness measures. And also we do provide sub grants to our jurisdictions. Community Improvement Councils do apply for that and they do fund preventative services and resources for children that are at risk of being in the child welfare system, as well as 
help fund dependency attorneys so cases are not stuck in the system for so long because we do have a limited amount of attorneys um, that practice dependency. Okay. It's a lot of great stuff those funds are working on. So that's great. You mentioned briefly the strategic plan. So what are some of the key components of the Nevada CIP strategic plan? So the Nevada CIP strategic plan is very fluid and there are six priority areas right now. It's data, disparity and disproportionality. So that's the second one. The third is quality court hearings. Four is quality legal representation. Five is timeliness and permanency. Six is ICWA and tribal representation. Oh, okay. So how are these goals set and prioritized within the strategic plan? Like, and what criteria are used to assess? Maybe you went into that a bit already, but the effectiveness of these. So the priority areas are identified or kind of set based on, of course, the federal requirements and their guidance. And then we kind of assess of what our state and local jurisdictions are needing and their goals as well. And then we also, you know, consider when we meet with the CIP Select Committee and our child welfare agencies, the overarching issues and goals that we want to reach and what CIP or the judicial and legal system could really help with reaching the goals as a state in a whole for the child welfare system. You talked about permanency being kind of a large priority. So how does the program work to achieve timely permanency for children who come into the court's jurisdiction? So this one's a little bit difficult to answer because it's not just the program. It's kind of promoting best practices and researching and finding what the best practices are to achieve timely permanency. And also CIP has to always consider and You know, it's in the forefront that not every jurisdiction has the resources or practices the same. So what we do encourage and promote in order to achieve timely permanency to the best of our jurisdiction's ability is collaboration, participating in community improvement councils. Look at the data. We do have a CFS 775 data report that we are working on modifying right now with um, the Child Welfare Agency. And that's been around for, uh, I believe, a decade. And it's just looking at your timeliness measures. Also, early engagement with parents, partners, um, identifying resources as early as possible, even though that is you know, very difficult right now because we are experiencing a shortage in resources. And also a big one, um, and which our jurisdictions are awesome at doing, is scheduling hearings in advance. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying this episode of All Out Nevada. We're always striving to bring you valuable insights and education, not just for judicial officers, but for anyone interested in the Nevada judiciary. If you find our content helpful or intriguing, please share your experience with your friends, family, and colleagues. Your support helps us reach a broader audience and ensures that more people can benefit from our discussions. Thank you for listening and supporting All Out Nevada. So how does Nevada ensure the protection of children's rights in abuse and neglect cases? In Nevada, a child who is an alleged abuse and neglected case has the right to be a party under NRS 432B420, and they're also appointed attorney to represent them. The child must be represented by an attorney at all stages of the proceedings held pursuant to NRS 432B410 and 432B590. So the attorney representing the child in these cases have the same authority and the rights as an attorney representing any other party in the proceedings. So the courts do their best to appoint an attorney to a child for every proceeding at the beginning stages. Okay. So how does the program incorporate continual quality improvement component into its operations? CIP does everything that will help their CQI efforts because the federal government and ourselves want to make sure we can see and identify areas that need improvement or areas that we want to emphasize on because we're doing so well. So that includes data reports. I've mentioned the Timeliness 775 report. We are working on a 4E eligibility report. The 4E eligibility report is a new report that we are working on, and that's helping the implementation of statewide court order templates. This allows us to see if the orders that provide 4E funding, which relates to services for children and families, are having the right language, because if the right language that is required by the feds is not in the orders, 
they will not pass eligibility and that will deny funding for our children and families. Um, services are really important for families in our system because a big population of the families in our system are underserved or under-resourced families. Um, we also have the Judicial Court and Attorney Measures of Performance, JCAMP. That is a new measure performance that came out of the Children's Bureau, the American Bar Association, and the Capacity Building Center for Courts. JCAMP was developed to help the judicial and legal stakeholders and communities measure their progress. Most of these communities or fields don't have data like the child welfare agency have, and the child welfare agencies go into an extensive review, such as the Child and Family Services Review, which leads to the program improvement plans. And the ABA, along with the Children's Bureau, were like, you know what? What are our courts doing? What are our legal stakeholders doing? And they developed this tool. Nevada was one of the states that went the furthest of implementing the tool. We are in our sustainability stage. And we are hoping that JCAMP will really help us identify what we're doing well, areas of improvement, and it's going to be a consistent baseline that we can look back and see over time. So it sounds like Nevada is kind of leading the implementation of JCAMP in some ways. Yes, I am very excited about that. Um, a big shout out to all our stakeholders that were part of JCAMP. It was an extensive process. And a lot of our stakeholders came through from our young adults with lived experience. We have parent mentors. We have judges that were part of it. Child welfare agency. It was a very big collective effort. And without the culture of Nevada wanting to do better for children and families, we wouldn't get this far um, in being one of the states that went the furthest in implementing JCAMP. Yeah, that's awesome. Really impressive. It is no small task to bring together a lot of different voices and solve a complex issue like that. So you hit it on. Yes, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. OK, so um, looking forward for CIP, what are some of the for future goals for CIP in Nevada? Oh, man, there we are CIPing and, and working away. <laughs> um, some of the future goals for CIP in Nevada is we do have our dependency attorney training, and I believe it was done in 2017. Since then, there's been so many changes, and that's a while ago. So in the future, CIP wants to look into or work on a 432B Academy. You know, we do need training, and we really want to welcome attorneys to the dependency field. I'm hoping it's an in-person training in our new training facilities that the Supreme Court is going to have. Excited about that. The sustainability of JCAMP, having validity, consistent progress measurement for judicial and legal practices, something that has really brought the attention of many and it is impacting our resources and our practices is the low pay of dependency attorneys. So we're hoping to find a way to raise that throughout the state. And also, we're one of the few states that does not have a dependency section in Nevada Rules of Civil Procedure. So the CIP Select Committee is really exploring that um, and hoping to add a section to match the dependency timeframes that we have. And overall, just increase engagement with all our stakeholders um, and not to work in silos because our families touch a variety of systems, the criminal justice system, the juvenile system, um, child welfare, even our community partners has just continued to increase the collaboration amongst each other for the best interest of our families and children. OK, so tying into that a little bit, what are some challenges CIP faces currently or do you see in the future for you? Well, Chuck <laughs> kind of mentioned that earlier. He made a comment, and that's exactly what I think the biggest challenge for um, CIP work is, is you have a group of stakeholders that, are, you know, have to be adversarial, but then they have to find common ground and work together. And that's one of the biggest challenges. I call it world because it, dependency is unique, and anybody that practices dependency We'll, we'll say the same. It's unique. So I call it dependency world. Um, the challenge is, is we have to be adversarial, go to court. But then again, these same stakeholders are in a community improvement council. They work as a team and identify what works best for their community and their families. Um, and that goes along with a challenging 
topics when we're working on JCAMP and what's important to them, to legislation. It's the most challenging, but yet most beautiful, I think, part of working with dependency stakeholders. Sounds very rewarding, yes. So for listeners who don't know, could you just kind of briefly describe like what is dependency? Yeah. So dependency often gets confused with family court or, um, you know, divorce and family civil proceedings. Dependency is cases involving children who have been abused, neglected or in the juvenile justice system. Dependency refers to the fact that children are dependent on adults for protection. That's a really Mm -hmm. great question. That's a good answer. (laughs) So how can somebody get involved with CIP in their community? My information is made available to the public. So I do have emails coming in from members of the public, various stakeholders, community members. Just email me at zmartinez at mvcourts.nv.gov. We also do an extensive amount of work reaching out to our young adults that experience the child welfare system, as well as parents that experienced a dependency proceeding and had child welfare cases. So we do try our best. It's kind of harder for the administrative level to be, you know, boots on the ground, but we actually do our best to reach out to organizations or partners that do work a lot with our children and families and say like, hey, we need your feedback. What's going on here? How can we help you guys? Please respond to these surveys. So Would it also include things like volunteering with CASA or how can somebody get involved to support the efforts of CIP in their community? The community can get involved in a variety of ways. We do send our day camp surveys, which have a big section of um, youth who've experienced the child welfare system, as well as parents. Um, Spread awareness of the need of foster homes. During COVID, we lost a lot of the foster homes for our kiddos, and a lot of them had to be separated. And we want to keep them in their community um, around, you know, their schools and what they know and they love as much as possible. So promoting foster homes or the need for foster homes, become a CASA, get involved with that, and also support our social workers. They go through a lot. They bear a lot of the weight of this work. They're the forefront and supporting them in any way that we can is something that not just the community of the, the public community, but also our dependency community community can do is, is support our social workers. So are there any resources available to those interested in learning more about CIP and its initiatives or getting involved? Yes, great question. We do have a lot of trainings on our website. Also, I have connections to a variety, several, several resources that we can connect you with. We can help put on trainings for you, apply for CLEs. CIP is a treasure of resources. We really can connect you with from the federal level to the state and the local level. We can make that connection. If we don't know, we'll figure out how we can help you find any resources that we need because we really want to keep the quality of the work that we do in dependency going. Just reach out to us. And we can certainly uh, see about getting some links attached into the description of this episode. So we'll work on that afterwards. CIP does a lot. It has a lot of responsibilities and it does a lot of great work. So I'm curious from your perspective, what is the most rewarding part of your role? As a person being part of a lot of systems growing up, I think the most rewarding part is when I see my colleagues doing the best they can for the community and the children and the families in the system, that when they come together and they really put away their differences the best they can to promote better outcomes, I just think it's the most rewarding part and just seeing how authentically engaged they are. it, um, It really makes me look forward to the next day of working in CIP. That's Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. Well put. (laughs) Thanks. All right. So as we kind of wrap up this conversation, do you have any examples or success stories you would be interested in sharing? What I think is a success story that can be strictly related to CIP is the 7th Judicial District. Judge Fairman and Judge Dabrescu really have a multi, they have a multidisciplinary team, which they identify kids or kiddos that could be at risk of being in the child welfare system. And they applied for grants and they work diligently hard to provide resources for them. And they are really making a difference. They're taking advantage of the grants or resources or community improvement council and their team and really making an impact in those children's lives. 
in their community lives. Yes. That's great. That's awesome. I love to hear the, all the good stuff our judiciary is doing. And it's like Chuck pointed out earlier, it seems like Nevada really is kind of leading the way. Yes. Thank mm-hmm. you. Thank you for having me and giving me the opportunity to highlight what our jurisdictions mm-hmm. are doing in the dependency field. Absolutely. So thanks again, Zaida, very much for joining us. It's been a very informative and interesting discussion. And we've got a lot of valuable information that I think is really good for our audience. Thank you. Thank you. A heartfelt appreciation to our guest and to everyone who's tuned in to this episode. Before we wrap up, here are a couple of quick, important reminders. For continuing legal education credit, be sure to complete a certificate of attendance and email it to jepodcast.nvcourts.nv.gov. If you have any questions, topic suggestions, or comments, we welcome your input. Please email them to jepodcast.nvcourts.nv.gov. We value and look forward to hearing from our listeners. Stay tuned for more episodes of All Allow Nevada, released twice a month. This is Seth Easley signing off. Take care, Nevada. <laughs>